I am excited to bring the message to you this morning. I only preach about once a year. I feel honored to get this opportunity. Most ministers have a process they go through to prepare a sermon, and I am no different, but my process is probably different. I spend a couple of weeks filled with anxiety and trying to think of reasons I can't possibly do a sermon right now. I mentally go through all my weaknesses and failures and reasons why I should not be doing this. When I finally reconcile myself to the probability that I will be giving a sermon, then I begin the process of praying and waiting on the Lord. I get my laptop set up, folder on the desktop for the sermon, and then I wait. God never fails me, but sometimes God really surprises me. Our God is an amazing God, a God of love and a God of surprises. I begin my days at 5 a.m. with a couple of hours of quiet time and reading and writing. About three years ago, I started writing my thoughts in a spiral notebook every morning. I fix my morning tea, get in my recliner with my notebook, and the first thing I do is write down at the very top all the names and situations that I'm praying for. And then I'm picturing in the people that I pray for as I write their name. After praying, I write the date and begin to let the thoughts flow. Some morning, the, pr the page is filled with thanksgiving and praise. A lot of mornings. It's filled with worries, my concerns, my guilt, my lostness, my confusion, but it always ends with I love you. For as messy or as wonderful as it is, it is my way of reaching out to connect to God. On June 17th, just as I finished writing, I love you, a very strong thought crossed my mind. Keep writing. A letter to you from God. <laughs> what? I kept on writing and was blown away by the precious moment in time with God. I'm going to disclose the contents with you because this is the letter that helped me begin to understand what God wanted me to share with you this morning. June 17th. I saw you before you were born. You were in danger, and I interceded. And you joyfully entered the world of my children. You were loved by your parents, prayed for by your grandparents. You were safe and joyful, playful and filled with love until you weren't. Abandoned for six months at three years of age brought fear, anxiety, guilt, anger, feelings of not being good enough, loneliness, and powerlessness. You were restored to your family, safe again, but fear and anxiety, anger at your mom, guilt and feelings of not being enough settled in, and it squashed the joy, the peace, the love that was your beginning. You were taught about me, and you latched on. There were rules that if you obeyed ensured that I would always love you and keep you safe. Those rules were a light to your path toward me until they weren't. You moved into your teen years, your becoming years, and it turned your world upside down. Rules did not make sense because they didn't address your sufferings or your terrible feelings of inadequacy and uncontrollable feelings of awakening as a young woman. There was no understanding, just rules. Don't, don't, don't. God won't love you. Fear of damnation, judgment from morning until night, wanting so badly to fit in with your peers, wanting to know you were worthy, important, in control. When you arrived at young adulthood, you had completely let go of me. I did not let go of you, my precious child. You did things your way. You made choices out of your fears and out of your loneliness, and those decisions led you to a deep night of the soul. I never abandoned you. How could I, with your grandmother reminding me through her prayers? I patiently waited for you to do all things in your power. And then the night came when you surrendered to your lostness, and I came in, into your mind. I revealed myself to you. My light surrounded you, 
and I called you by name. Linda, I love you exactly like you are. And if you will follow me for the next 27 years, things will be far greater and more wonderful than you can imagine. And there you were. Joyful, playful, happy, grateful, and filled with hope and joy and love. You turned that night, and you followed me, and it has been an amazing journey. And I will say amen to that. I was 27 years old when this event happened. I was a secretary in the middle of a divorce with a precious two-year-old little girl to raise. I could barely keep a roof over our heads. I had no hope of a meaningful future, but that all changed that evening. I had never experienced such love and incredible forgiveness. There was no question that I would follow, and because of my church Sunday school upbringing, I knew that Scripture was one of the ways I could discover how to follow this God. Scripture came alive for me, and I began to study, and soon I was le leading women's groups and leading Bible studies. During that time, God brought my amazing Richard into my life. And we had two more precious daughters and years of teaching and learning and loving God. In 1983, God brought me into ministry, a ministry that I would give my life to for the next 35 years. He also called Richard to serve with me. Forty years ago this past January, I taught my first sexuality education class to a group of high school youth, which included my oldest daughter. God knew my heart so well and knew because of my suffering in my own teen years, I wanted my daughters and all children to have a different understanding about their bodies, God's love, and God's amazing gift of sexual intimacy. I wrote, published, and updated five curriculums for use in the church, and we trained over 100 churches throughout the United States in our curriculums with faith-based sexuality education for elementary through adults, we reached over 10,000 men, women, and children. In 1988, we began a camping ministry called Created to Be Me that reached youth at Disciple of Christ camps, like at Gonzo, around the United States the summer before they entered high school, a camp that gives them the education they need and a safe space to learn about God's gifts, the blessings and consequences of misuse, forgiveness, Jesus as a role model, and God's faithful love. We have reached almost 8,000 youth with this program. Richard and I were sleeping in bunk beds and keynoting and presenting workshops for weeks of camp every summer, right up until I was 75 and he was 78. What an exciting life we had. What a joy it was to educate and inspire adults and youth all over this country with knowledge about our amazing God. While the ministry God built with us continues on, Richard and I have been in retirement trying to adjust to a new way of life. Truly, I miss not speaking and teaching and working with God in ministry every day. But now I finally have time to spend with God, Richard, and my church family. And a funny thing happened about that. I began to see our world and the shape it was taking. I'd been so busy running a ministry for 35 years that the world was just background noise because I was so focused and there was so much to do. Now I found myself with time on my hands and 24-hour news channel. Uh, I became mesmerized by all of it until I wasn't. It was a novelty at first, and I felt it was my duty to understand what was happening in the world, and that led me to a very different place. I became angry, depressed. I began having feelings of outrage and powerlessness. I found myself screaming and yelling at the television as if somebody was actually going to hear me and respond to me. I started having feelings of intense anger for the people on the other side. Didn't matter which one, I changed from time to time depending on what the situation was. I began to see our world as evil and headed for destruction and the church community as was depicted in the media, was all over the place. I finally reached a point where I was spending most of my days feeling depressed and angry or afraid for the future. It got so bad, I finally called my mentor, and I asked if she could spend some time with me. I shared that because I heard God's voice and saw his light and God knew my name, 
I was never worried about losing my faith. My problem was I was losing faith in my ability to discern God's voice. I could not hear God in the midst of all the chaos. All of us, whether we are believers or not, cannot miss the chaos we are living in day in and day out. The political chaos seems to be the worst, as it is unleashed upon us from the time we read the paper in the morning until we turn the TV off at night. The strangest part of the great political divide is that you can actually hear truth leaking out from each side of the political de debate. But because they're not listening to each other, nobody ever comes to an understanding because the rhetoric is filled with hateful comments, demeaning descriptions of the people on the other side, and that is coming from both sides. What is important to them is that they retain the power. So truth comes forth as well as spin. We witness violence, name-calling, hate-filled rhetoric, fear for safety, retribution, judgment, and chaos in our streets and throughout our cities. We have the great gender meltdown going on all over the world but it is especially lethal in our country. Everyone has taken sides and turned this issue into a political football that has all sides upset and calling each other names. Again, no one is listening to each other. It's just hate-filled and blaming confusion. Then we have the environmental issues that have become totally politicized and filled with scary predictions or easy fixes while the climate is going crazy and we are whistling in the dark. Where is God's voice in all this? Well, I've come to understand and believe that God's voice is not in the chaos. 1 Corinthians 14 says, God isn't a God of disorder, but of peace. If God is not a God of disorder, then all that chaos and noise is not where God will be found. God has shown me that we are being drawn into this chaos as a diversion as long as we focus on all that is evil and wrong, then we will not be focused on God. And he's our only hope in times of trouble. We will be anxious and fearful like the lost sheep Jesus talks about in Scripture that feel like they have no shepherd. John 14, Jesus' words to us, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I give to you not as the world gives. Don't be troubled or afraid. In this chaotic world where definition of words we have used forever are changing on a daily basis, where beliefs and principles we've counted on forever are no longer relevant, where things we thought were good are now bad and vice versa, how is it we follow Jesus and hear God? If we could go back, would we see Jesus relating to any of this? Would his answers in the past work for the future? Scripture is filled with stories of prophets who foretold the future for God's people, but it appears that not many heeded or understood the warnings and information from those predicting the future. I wonder if looking back to the way Jesus lived would give us a better indication of how we should be living in our future. So for a few minutes, let's go back to the future. The time Jesus lived among us was a very dangerous and scary time to be alive, especially if you were a Jew. Jesus, the disciples, and the Jewish people were living under the complete control of the Roman Empire. They had absolutely no power, no status, heavy taxation, cruelty from the Romans, and they were considered by most as scum of the earth. This nation of former slaves were extremely oppressed, and they were incredibly overtaxed and could have a roof over their head one day and it all be taken away the next day. There was no physical security. There was no medical security. There was no personal security. And with all of that, Jesus didn't take on the Romans, the worst of the oppressors. To make matters worse during that chaotic time, many of the religious leaders of the day seem not to have any empathy or ability to bring any kind of peace and understanding. They were too busy with making people feel guilty for all the rules that they were breaking and trying to prove that their rules and their ways were the only way. They brought little comfort or answers. The Jewish nation was eagerly awaiting equality, freedom, deliverance from oppression. 
deliverance that would come when the Messiah arrived. They were almost as divided a nation as we are today. They had no power. But many believed the Messiah they were waiting for would be a great warrior and would defeat the oppressors and put the Jewish nation in charge once again. As it turned out, another Messiah was also predicted, but he was not a conqueror, not a warrior, and so the people didn't look to that prophecy. The last thing people on earth needed was another warrior, another conqueror. They had evolved into people who understood war and domination too well. God's earthly children were destroying the world God had so lovingly given them, and they were destroying each other. God intervened in an incredible, surprising, and creative way. God sent his son to live among us, to be helpless and dependent as a young baby, to be curious and energetic as a teenager, to be innovative, creative, and God-loving as a young adult. He had an important message to deliver. God is here and wants to know you and for you to know him and love him and each other. In going back in time in order to see our future, the first thing I noticed is that the major job of the church had to undertake was to get the word out that Jesus came, lived among us, died, and was resurrected, and then sent the Holy Spirit back to live in us and work through us. They were called to go out into the world proclaiming the word. In my own life, I'm beginning to understand that God is asking us to go out into the world with the same message but not to use words. To let our loving of others and God's world shine through us so that we can meet the needs of everyone that Jesus sends to us for healing, clothing, feeding, housing, rescuing. And I personally know that when God calls you to serve him, he also equips you to do what is needed. God definitely equipped me through the years to do the ministry he called me to. I have witnessed as a member of this church for 25 years some amazing service by this church. Especially remember a woman many years ago whose husband left her, and she was absolutely devastated. She was unable to function properly, and she began to hoard until her home was completely filled up. When it was brought to the attention of some of our very loving and ministry-driven people at this church, they intervened, not with words, or platitudes, but with actual dedicated work. They came in and completely restored her home. At that time years ago, just those who performed this service and the minister knew what was going on, but the act of love and service completely turned her life around. It gave her a new start, a new hope for the future. Another example was during the 2017 flood where our church became the spontaneous community rescue center and the entire community responded to the needs our church was trying to fulfill so that suffering could be lessened, people could be fed, clothed, and housed. I strongly believe that God started moving our congregation several years ago into the future work of the church for this time in history. But there is much to be done. People in our community and around the world are suffering, and their suffering will only be relieved by those with compassion and God's creativity to help us meet the needs. Many of the prisons in the state of Texas are not air-conditioned. For the most part, no one from those prisons is receiving meaningful rehabilitation and very little help when they get out. Children go to bed hungry in our own community every day. We have to begin to involve ourselves in truly loving our neighbors, no matter where they are imprisoned. This is the moment for God's children to rise up and think about their brothers and sisters and about this wonderful world our God has made for us. I see the first pages of scripture in Genesis as God setting up his special creation home for his very special children. The design and uh, mystery of the universe is incredible. But the care, the beauty, the creativity, the diversity of our home that God prepared, planet Earth, is breathtaking. Everything we would ever need and more. What must our precious God be thinking when he sees how we abuse and neglect and fight over whether to care for our home or to just assume it will all be okay? 
God actually put us in charge of that, the stewardship of this planet. That is our responsibility. We have in this precious congregation Elaine Kimsey who understands this call for care for our physical home. And she's desperately trying to get us to pay attention and begin to implement ways we as individuals and a church family can do our part in caring for our planet Earth home. Oh, sweet family, we have only just begun. We have the amazing opportunity of truly changing lives and their futures. If we will just stop, listen for God, and say yes to what we are asked to do. Our church is on the way to building bridges in the community, reaching out to those in need of housing and food, helping with the educational needs of students and teachers, and being available to people in need as they come to us. This is such a diverse and smart congregation of believers, and I think we may have some of the world's answers within us if we will but just listen and believe God wants to use us and then step out to make a difference. One last thing. If we ever hope to have our world heal from its divisiveness, its harmful rhetoric, its hopelessness, and its hatefulness, it will only happen if we, the people, rise up and show a different way to live and to respond. We have to lead lives of complete inclusiveness. By that I mean we worship and work and love people who believe exactly opposite of us without trying to change the way they live or the way they think. We are to walk alongside, to love, to assist, to care for when called upon. That was the example Jesus displayed for us. This is extremely hard to do because all of us think we have the right answers. And if others would believe like us, then everything would be wonderful. If we keep quiet and listen instead of talking and trying to convince, we may discover a new truth, a new truth that will make all the difference. The story I shared in the beginning about my encounter with God was missing a very important component. In the middle of my disastrous life, I got a job working in a three-girl office in the law department of Humble Oil. I only knew a God of rules and judgment and had walked away from God and the church, but the two women I worked with served and loved a God that loved all of us and was non-judgmental, a loving and forgiving God. I did not believe a word of that. They unknowingly, by their treatment of me and others, softened my heart. So the night of my deepest despair, I was able to hear our God's loving words to me. Without their acceptance of me, their kindness toward me, their tolerance of me, and their love for me, my life might not have changed that night. It was originally said to the early church, our brothers and sisters, go out into the world and tell the good news. Today, I believe Jesus is saying, go out into the world and love and live the good news. May it be so.